in China more than any other country, you can't separate sports from politics from business. Those three strands are inextricably linked, just sort of woven together. And you try and unpick them, but you really can't. There is much that we know about China as an economic superpower, but there is also much that we can learn from China, the sports superpower. Today, China is second only to the United States as the world's foremost sporting nation, calculated on the basis of its medals tally at the Olympics. But there is much that other countries can learn from how China built that capability. Sports gives us a glimpse of not just the game, but the society in which it is cultivated. The relationship between the state and the grassroots in society, the ability of the state to cultivate the full potential of its people. Equally, it gives us a glimpse of the issues that the country is likely to face in the future. Many of China's individual sports stars want to do their own thing today. We also learn from the sports that China is not good at, despite working at it so hard over so many years. Mark Dreyer is an English journalist who moved to China during the 2008 Olympics and never left. He has spent nearly 15 years in the trenches, tracking China's sports industry. He attends and writes about a wide cross-section of games and events across the country, giving foreign media an insider's perspective of China's sports industry. He knows many of the leading sportsmen, coaches and teams personally. He recently published his own book, Sporting Superpower, an insider's view on China's quest to be the best. It's an unvarnished description of how China's sports machinery works. I liked it that he discussed many of the issues facing China's sports industry candidly. I caught up with Mark in Beijing, literally on the eve of the 2022 Winter Olympics. We talked about sports and society broadly. He gave me his insights into where he thought Chinese sports is today, where it is heading and the issues it will face in the future. Mark, it's a lovely, lovely evening, uh, lovely winter's evening here in Beijing. Yeah. Uh, and you live in a nice part of town. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to meet you after having read uh, your amazing book, Sporting Superpower, an insider view of China's quest to be the best. I actually came across your book a few, uh, just about a week and a bit more, read it over Chinese New Year, not all of it, but you know, it was a good fast read because you told it in a storytelling form, and I absolutely wanted to speak with you. Uh, you've been here since 2008. You've uh, felt the ground. You've, uh, you've got a feel of Chinese uh, sports. Um, and I'd like to do this conversation with you um, to speak a little bit about the book. And in fact, the book captures just about your entire experience from the time you arrived to this year. You've written the chapters in, you know, in year format. So it's like a chronology as well as um, you know substance of sports the main reason i wanted to talk to you is because sports gives us a feel of the grassroots of the ground of the substance of a country yeah uh, and i want to be able to capture that in, in this conversation with you uh, at a big level uh, china the, the the sporting nation um, you know one of the two major sporting nations of the world one diametrically different from the other and China, the grassroots, the everyday man, um, you know, and what sports and his own personal ambitions are and stuff like that. Let's start by asking you, um, you know, tell us, you know, how, when did the China story start with you and, and sports in general, um, you know, your background and when you arrived in China? Well, I used to work uh, um, for Sky Sports in the UK as a, as a football soccer reporter for about five years. And then I met my now wife, um, uh, we were dating at the time. She was based in New York and I was in London. So we were kind of long distance for a while. But I, I, I moved over to New York um, and worked for Fox Sports or what was then the Fox Soccer Channel. So I stayed in, stayed in the same sport, but also covered some other things, tennis and golf and, and, and some, some other sports too. And then it was uh, towards the end of 2007 and one of the series that, um, uh, that I'd been working on for Fox had just wrapped. And my wife was setting up a company that was partly based in, in the US and partly based here. The Olympics were, were kind of looming into view on the horizon. I'd never covered an Olympics, but I'd always grown up watching them and, and was a huge fan. And we just thought, yeah, let's go for a year. What's the worst that can happen? We can move back. Um, 
15 years later, <laughs> still, still here. And there's another Olympics literally a day away. And yeah, we, we're here right now, uh, you know, on the day before the, the Winter Olympics uh, that China is hosting. Let's break down this conversation, uh, you know, to, to keep it very compact. At the same time, uh, you know, cover as much ground as possible. China, the sporting nation, you know, um, at the Olympics, at the 2021 or 2020 Olympics in to Tokyo, 30-odd uh, gold, gold medals, um, yeah. you know. Uh, a foreigner looking at China will say, oh, that this country is way up at the top there. Break it down for us. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what are the sports that China tends to be good at and uh, and what are the sports that China is struggling with? In fact, I, I, I do notice in your book, a, 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 a big section of it is on soccer. Uh, you know, the, it's a big the, deal here. It's yeah. a big deal. It's a big angst in the Chinese psyche. Yes. I mean, just this week to, to, to stay on soccer for a second, uh, you know, China lost 3-1 to Vietnam, basically the only team in the qualifying group that everyone thought, okay, well, that's, that's definitely a given that, that we're going to win that one. Uh, so mathematically then out of contention for the 2022 World Cup. We knew they weren't going to qualify. But, you know, there was there's yet another outpouring of, of angst, of kind of, you know, depression, almost some humor, some sort of dry humor. People are, you know, joking about, can we really reach a new low uh, when it comes to soccer? So on the one end of the scale, you, you've got like tremendous Olympic success when it comes to gold medals. Uh, they were winning the medal table for the longest time. The U.S. overhauled them in Tokyo on the very last day. Uh, that was against all expectations. We thought the U.S. was probably going to uh, was probably going to win it fairly comfortably, but it was, it was very close at the end. So top two, you know, one or two uh, when it comes to those sports, but they're often you know sports that people don't play. China gets a lot of um, weightlifting golds and, and shooting golds. You know, there aren't too many. It's not like a mass participation sport for the masses, and so there is still a sense that at, that at the popular level, what are the popular sports? Well, soccer obviously is number one, and China knows. Well, there's only one gold medal uh, at the Olympics for that. And of course, the World Cup is more important than the Olympics when it comes to football. So there's only so much uh, that it can that it's going to maximize when it's focused on doing well and maximizing its potential at the Olympics. But deep down, the country can know as well, you know, it's, it's, it's slightly hollow winning all those goals because people, they, they trade that in a second for a competitive football team. Is it really hollow? Uh, is is the Chinese national pride uh, now past Olympic goals? It's a great question. It's really complicated. And I've noticed shifts kind of go one way and then back the other way. Uh, let's talk about these games right now. The narrative is very much is winter sports. So China's not as dominant. It's probably going to finish about 10th in the medal table. So respectable, but it's not a powerhouse nation. It's not top one, uh, one or two. It's certainly not top five either. Um, it could be, could be about top five, maybe in a few Olympic, winter Olympic cycles down the road. But right now, we're sort of, you know, China's 10th in the world, there or thereabouts. Um, and so the narrative has changed to Xi Jinping, the president, has already said, I don't care how many gold medals China wins. Now, is that true? Well, what he means is, let's not focus on gold at all costs, which is historically what China has done, particularly in the summer sports. So they're trying to sort of reframe that narrative and sort of redefine success to mean something like, uh, let's have an athlete in every single event. So what they have is 176 athletes at these games, um, more than double the 80 athletes they had four years ago in Pyeongchang in South Korea. So that in some senses represents tremendous progress and tremendous growth of the winter sports industry as a whole, you know, as represented by China's elite athletes. Does it convert into medal success? This year, probably not, but it might do in the future. So when it comes to, to, to winter success, um, you know, they're, they're, like I said, they've redefined it. But what I will say is, because once you've tried to, to set that message, we're not about the medals, then of course, behind the scenes, you've got people working furiously to still win as many medals as possible. And so the narrative within the sports industry and within the sports uh, authorities is, how many gold medals are we going to win? Um, you know, and, and the foreign coaches are brought in and they're basically given a task, win a gold medal. And, and you're a cross-country coach and you're like, well, that's just not going to happen. We're not going to compete with the Norwegians and the, the other European nations. A top 30 result for some of the Chinese athletes would be phenomenal. Right? It would be really, really good and impressive for, for how far they've come. But you've still got that summer Olympic context where you're basically winning, you know, handfuls of goals, you know, by the dozens. 
And so people like top 30, like, you know, what, What's that you know mean? that's embarrassing for China. It's, it's not, actually. If you look at the context, it's a fantastic result. But reframing that, getting the whole population on board with that is, is a challenge. What you just said about what Xi Jinping said about, uh, you know, let's not focus on the goal, actually is consistent with what he's been saying about common prosperity. Like, you know, we, we want participation, yeah. Yeah. Um, grassroots, a feel of the ground. Um, just talk me through a little bit of the sports that China has done well in uh, and how did they get to the goal stage um, you know, in, in the individual sports like gymnast, gymnastics and, as you said, weightlifting and so on. And there's a handful of sports that they've mastered the technique, they've aced the game, as it were. Yeah. What did it take for China to ace the game? They've been very strategic when it comes to the Olympics in particular. And it's not to say that other countries have not been, you know, um, you can probably tell from my accent, I come from the UK and, and, you know, Great Britain has been very strategic in terms of funding in sports where it thinks it has medal potential. So this is not new and specific to China, but China has, if not unlimited funds, they have pretty good resources when they want to, when they want to allocate it like that. So 75% of China's um, gold medals in the Olympics, historically of all time, have come from just six sports. So that kind of shows you, and, and there's, there's all the usual ones you'd expect. You know, you've got table tennis, gymnastics, diving is one that they often get a clean sweep or there or thereabouts of the, the gold. Synchronized timing. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them doing yeah, so well. Yeah. Uh, uh, of the gold medals. Um, but they've also sort of targeted the, the, the less competitive, um, uh, competitive sports. So let me give you an example from, from winter sports. The sliding sports, so that's bobsleigh and luge and skeleton. There are a few hundred elite level sliding athletes in the world. It's just not something that, that people do in great numbers, right? It's very expensive. You need a, a bobsled track, which is you know incredibly hard to find and expensive, and you need all the equipment. So basically, if you're starting from zero, that's something that you can catch up with with a lot of money and resources and funding. And they've got all the foreign coaches in and put all the technology into building their own sled using you know rocket powered type, you know, uh, all, all the simulations and so on. Compare that to soccer, where you have literally billions of people around, and at the top level, you have incredibly competitive uh, uh, players. So, so the standard there is, is, is just harder to catch up, whereas it's not unrealistic to think that four or eight years from now, China could be winning a lot of medals in those sliding sports. I think it's probably too soon for them to do it um, at the 2022 Olympics. We'll see some progress. There's, there's a couple of athletes who are... Um, you know, there or thereabouts. And actually, one of the female athletes, or one of the two flag bearers for these games is a skeleton athlete. I don't think she's going to get on the podium, frankly, but I think they, they see her as the future and potentially four or eight years from now, uh, she could get there. There's a little bit of um, state planning involved, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of allocating resources and the technology, as you say, the bobsleighing and so on. And, um, um, and then just working the system till you know they arrive um, at a certain skill level. There are also sports where you know this is a country of 1.5 billion people. If you take soccer for example, or, or whatever hockey, field hockey, is there a kind of a divide between um, team games and individual games? Is it a fair comment to say that China tends to be good at individual sports and not very good at uh, team sports? It's a cliche to a certain extent, but I, I think often the cliches and the stereotypes, you know, are based in at least some truth. Um, you know, it, it, it's partly the way that you train these sports. So, for example, if you, and I'm exaggerating it, but if you take 50,000 gymnasts and stick them in, you know, China's state-run gymnastics factory, the top one is basically going to win Olympic gold. You know, that, that's how it works. Or, or diving, you know, you know, like, obviously, it's it's not just as simple as they turn up. There's other nations too, but... It's been very successful in the sports where, frankly, you are trying to do the same thing again and again and again with repetition. Um, and you have, you have it in such numbers that it doesn't matter about the training systems. Uh, for team sports, it's very, very different because just think about it. If you're on the soccer field and you could be technically brilliant, but if you do the same thing every time, if you always have the same move, you're quite easy to defend against, right? That doesn't apply when you're you know, doing a gymnastics routine or when you're doing a diving routine, when you want to be exactly as you were in the previous one. So again, it, it is a little bit cliche to, to sort of say China can't excel in team sports. There are some exceptions. Women's volleyball, they've seen some success, if, although not at Tokyo. 
China has done, for example, the women's soccer team previously have been okay, although they've been having a bit of a rocky patch recently. Um, but yeah, by and large, uh, it, it's a complicated thing. There's a whole number of factors that go into it. For a country of 1.5 billion people, if, if we were to go to certain pockets of the country, do you think there is undiscovered, undiscovered talent still there? I was reading somewhere, I'm not, and I'm not sure if it was the New York Times talking about um, cricket players, um, you know, in parts of the West, I, I, it could have been Xinjiang or yeah. or Yunnan. Uh, that that there are, there are, there's a community that actually likes cricket very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, you know, so are there pockets that you think that you know that are still undiscovered? Uh, and because it's a state-run um, system, uh, that uh, these pockets don't get the opportunity to you know to scale. Well, it's a great question. You're not the first person to ask that because. That's exactly what China has been looking at over the last few years. You mentioned Yunnan. There is a cross-country skier by the name of Chen Dejen who comes from Yunnan province in the southwest of, of the country. Basically tropical. You know, it's very hot there in the summer. He hadn't seen snow until 2019 for the first time. He was a high school track runner. He used to uh, run the, the 5,000, 10,000 meters. And so he was specifically recruited as someone who had good endurance, which is, you know, one of the, the, the characteristics you need to excel in cross-country skiing. They taught him how to ski, and he's taken to it pretty well. Now, he's not gonna win a medal, but he's young, and he's shown tremendous growth over the past uh, the past three years that he's been involved in it. It's incredible to think he's even lining up at the Olympics after just you know learning how to ski. It's literally less than three years ago. Um, so, again, this has been a deliberate strategy from China, not just to kind of uh, widen the base, uh, away from the northeastern hub, which is the traditional hub of, of where all the winter athletes uh, would would you know grow up with, grow with up snow and snow and ice, yeah. um, but also to kind of include the rest of the country. So now, for the first time, they can say, "Well, we have athletes from Yunnan, and we have there's two Tibetan athletes for the first time ever at these games. So there's a, there's plenty of uh, athletes from Xinjiang and, and from not exactly every province, but many more provinces than they've had in the past." In fact, you know, this is something that many countries that want to up the game on their own game on, on in, in sports and in the Olympics look to China to see what can we learn from China. Uh, there's this, you know, dichotomy between uh, a planned sports infrastructure and the grassroots sports infrastructure, yeah. you know. Um, and take soccer, for example. You, you know, you, you, you were mentioning about uh, uh, team sports and the problems that they have. In 2015, in your book, you mentioned that there was a state council uh, paper on, you know, how to manage the progress. Reportedly signed off by the big man himself, Xi Jinping. Who, who is yeah, a yeah. sport? Who is a soccer fan? Yeah. Um, you know, and how successful do these? Um, you know, obviously for individual sports, they have been very successful. You you work, you 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 push a thousand young people on through the system, and then you get one or two gold medals at the end. Um, but in um, the way they're constructing their state-run uh, process, or what do you see in that? I think you can't underestimate the power of government support here. Um, you only need to look at, uh, you know, one of the sports that I look at is baseball. And when baseball is in the Olympics, then there is support, there's funding, there's just at uh, all levels, uh, you know, baseball leagues are going to be thriving here if it's in the Olympics. Because it's one of the sports that's been in and out of Olympic cycles. And so when it's in, we see a huge difference to when suddenly it drops from the program. Um, the problem is when you have that state involvement, it doesn't always work. And, and when we talk about soccer, it's the classic example. It has to come from grassroots. But here's the problem. China, at its core, is a top-down society. Everything comes from the very top and it's mandated from above. And then the, uh, the, the lower levels are forced to implement it. That just simply doesn't work in soccer. You know, you've got these two different approaches diametrically opposed. and and. You know, you, I could talk for literally hours about, about the problems with soccer, but if I had to sum it up, it's that. It's this grassroots coming up against this top-down approach and they just don't work. Where are the points that they're not meeting? Um, you know, and actually, I even think that this whole thing of top-down approach for soccer comes from the Kennedy School of uh, Government in New York, uh, in, sorry, in, 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 uh, in Harvard University. Uh, because just about every government trained person who's been there uh, is taught to recognize that you know soccer is something that you need to have control over, and it's just some, something at the back of my mind because I see several governments doing this. Um, at the same time, um, governments 
and just not just China, but you know, uh, right across Asia and in a lot of developing countries, fail. Uh, and they fail sometimes because of, um, you know, it's too structured a process, and therefore it actually opens itself up to corruption and stuff like that. Uh, and then it it's also uh, not sensitive enough to identify talent uh, and pick them up um, and, and nurture them over a period of time. Um, you know, so it's something that you you've covered a lot in your book. Um, you know, uh, and and I'm really curious. Um, you know, if you think that China will uh, eventually crack the code uh, in soccer in the way that Japan has uh, to some extent. I was on a panel. Uh, it was a radio panel for for China Radio International um, around 2015 when the the big 50 point plan was announced, and there was one crucial thing in there that said we are going to separate the Chinese Football Association from the state. Um, now this basically is mandated by uh, FIFA that you can't have government interference in in, in soccer in the Football Association. Um, but of course it's China so everything ultimately reports in, into the government, into the top. And uh, there was a professor there who was sort of saying this is a great day for, for football, this is going to be fantastic and I sort of you know politely uh, sort of made the point that you know, in practice, that's, it's going to be tricky in China. It's just not how the country works. If you start separating things and being free from government control, that's a road down which China can't travel very easily because it, it start, starts to open some doors it doesn't want to open. It starts to ask some questions it doesn't want to answer. And so ultimately, we haven't really ever seen that freedom from government control. What that means is we don't have football people making football decisions. And if you're not a football person, then how are you supposed to know about the best things for football development. It's not rocket science to do this. Other countries have done it. They've put in place uh, a 20 year plan and they've followed it through. But there's, there's a number of problems that China has struggled with. One is government rotation. So you have government, uh, government ministers looking for quick wins because they want to get promotion and celebrate something three, four years down the line. But if you take the five year olds and then you're trying to celebrate how well they're developed at the age of eight or nine, that's not going to really get you promotion. So you've got to do something more splashy, more short term. And again, that's not going to lead you to, to long term success. So there's just there's so many different things. Uh, one example that's just popped into my mind, there was, a, there was an official from the Chinese, uh, the sports ministry, and a comment came out from this guy. And he said, the reason that the national soccer team is not playing well is because these players line up against each other for uh, for their club team week in week out in the Chinese Super League. So how can they possibly learn to play with each other on the same side, right? From his point of view, somehow this made sense. So anyone who's ever watched football anywhere in the world is like, what on earth, he, what on earth <laughs> are you talking about? Like every country, like the teammates. Made up of <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like for, for different teams and like it's just, you're playing for your national team, you're playing for your club, not a big difference. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the fundamentals. Um, and then I looked up this guy and, and, and his background, you know, was online somewhere. He'd come from some waterworks, you know, technology, uh, 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 polytechnic or something like that. I was like, okay, well, he studied, you know, like wastewater treatment, something or other. Like, of course, he doesn't really know about football. But how on earth is he in a position that he's making these fundamental decisions about how football should be run? I mean, it's like, it's, it's madness. Just listening to you describe that, I see China struggling with exactly the same issues in other aspects of society. You know, to what extent do you give uh, personal freedom to, um, you know, communities, individuals, and so on? Yeah. And, and to what extent um, is someone from the state, a pol politician, for, ex for example, uh, uh, able to you know, test the pet theory, you know, and say, you know, I think, you know, if they were more coherent as a group, they, they probably play better and stuff like that. Which leads me to my next question, because we really have a lot of ground to cover. And I, I just want to tick off the boxes as we go along. To what extent does China use bring in foreigners? So talk to me about uh, where do you see foreigners, uh, both in the coaches as well as in the players? Um, how are they incorporated? Uh, why? And uh, and how are they doing? China sees the, the long game. So it, it's trying to get, it's, it knows where it is um, realistically, even though sometimes the messaging is, is different. But I think inside, deep down, they know kind of the level they are at different sports and it's different, of course. But, you know, if we look at winter sports with the Olympics around the corner and they're here and they're trying to get to here, uh, ultimately, long term, they want Chinese developed uh, and homegrown athletes with Chinese coaches doing that. 
in some sports that's possible today uh, where they have success uh, but even in short track speed skating which is one of one of the areas where where china has excelled in the past there will still be a number of foreign coaches we have 176 athletes in the chinese delegation we have 51 foreign coaches foreign coaches um there are obviously chinese coaches as well that's a lot of foreigners brought in uh you mentioned players as well in the, in the hockey teams for both men's and women's about 60 percent of those squads are uh, north americans mostly canadians most of whom have some sort of Chinese heritage. And so they've been recruited over a number of years to sort of say, hey, do you want to represent like your, your other country? Obviously, you know, you know, have some, some Chinese roots there. Uh, and so a lot of people have signed up. The reason they've brought them in is because in the here and now, those players are better than what they, they already have to choose from. So we had a game earlier today. It was as one of the games that started actually ahead of the opening ceremony. There were some Chinese homegrown players, but they're seeing very little ice time. I mean, they're good for Chinese players and they've, they've made tremendous progress, but they're still a significant level below what these, with these basically Chinese Canadians are at at the level today. But long term, the plan is very much to, to, you know, combine the things together, use the foreign expertise, learn from the foreign coaches, but ideally long term, be able to do it themselves. Now we, we are well into 20 years into China's rise as a sporting nation. You have personalities. Um, on you know you have government the state process and so on and then you have stars um, and I think we've seen how the government has treated stars in in the technology area yeah. right uh, yeah. well, it's not very encouraging but um, and then there are stars like Lina like Ping Shui and that's um, Yao Ming and so on um, uh, what is what is the role of these stars how do they conduct themselves and uh, what is the, their relationship uh, to the associations, to, to promoting the sports? Um, what, what is the nature of their status uh, in the sports community, you think? Uh, and how is that different from stars in the UK or um, you know, in, other, in other countries? It's a difficult question to answer because I think it, it, it's, uh, there's some discrepancies between the sports. Um, I'll pick a couple of two, two of the, probably the fame, most two. Yao Ming, it, it, it will always be sporting royalty um, in China, but he's very much kind of, you know, he's very much a, a state person. He went overseas. He, he, you know, was an all-star for many years uh, when basketball was at its absolute peak uh, here in China. And so he was globally respected as a player, uh, but particularly, you know, fans were, were very proud of him here. He's come back. He's now got a leading role in the Chinese Basketball Association. He's been part of the, uh, the political gatherings as well. You know, he's, he's sort of studied academically. So he's just respected across every level. Um, but he's very much, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a fairly understated character. Um, but what's your personality? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's not sort of outspoken. He's sort of suggested a couple of times, for example, uh, when, the, when the big soccer plan came out, I think he was probably feeling a bit miffed. You know, basketball wasn't getting too much love. And he gently suggested that, oh, well, it'd be nice to kind of get, mm. get some of that support too. Right. But he wasn't, you know, he's not putting out any angry comments uh, for, for sure. Lina is another one um, who I think is a great example because she realized that the, the, the Chinese state system had given her a huge amount of support to get her to that level where she was. But she, she kind of felt that to get to the very top, she needed to change things. Um, and she scrapped and scrapped and scrapped with a number of other players. And they fought with the Chinese uh, Tennis Association. And it was a two-way dialogue. Uh, the narrative is very much that they broke free, but they were also let go to a certain extent. There was Madame Sun, uh, who was in charge of the Chinese Tennis Association at the time, and she basically gave her blessing to do this. So four players were allowed to go out and hire their own uh, coaching setups, uh, decide their own schedule, instead of everything being very tightly controlled. And pay um, their own way? They had to pay their own way, okay. but they didn't have to ship their winnings back to the state. I mean, they still had to give some, but, but they were able to retain a lot uh, higher percentage of their prize money. Um, so a lot of risk on both sides. Uh, but ultimately, with two Grand Slam wins for Lina, winning the French Open in 2011, the Australian Open in 2014, you have to say it was a success. It was combining the best of both worlds. It was that Chinese support from the ground up and, and then building on that with, with, with some, some more foreign expertise. And, and what we kind of got into is this sort of back and forth with different parties trying to claim credit. And the Chinese media was saying, well, she wouldn't be where she was today if she hadn't, you know, been developed by the Chinese system. And you had the foreign media saying she was only good because she was allowed to, you know, she, she 
uh, escaped from the, from the clutches of the Chinese system. And it, and it was a bit of both, right? And it was, it was and I, I kind of hate this phrase, you know, with Chinese characteristics, but it really was tennis with Chinese characteristics. It, it was the, the perfect meeting of, of, you know, the foreign world and the Chinese side and, and something that worked for China. And I think the biggest shame that I've seen is that China hasn't really been able to recreate that in too many other sports. And I think that was the perfect, you know, she got right to the very top. She was ranked number two in the world, two Grand Slam wins. That's very, very hard to do in tennis. We haven't seen anyone quite emulate her in tennis. Uh, but in other sports, I think that model is something that could have been applied. And, and in terms of characters, she was a dream personality. Global fans loved her. When she was uh, giving her victory English, speech, yeah. yeah, her victory speech in, in 2014 at the Australian Open, I mean, the whole stadium was, was, was collapsing in laughter. She was so funny. It wasn't like completely fluent, but good enough to communicate. And, you know, she, was, she could have been a, a global star. She could have been China's best soft and, power ambassador. It just... But, isn't that, wouldn't but that be wonderful? I mean, actually, yeah, yeah. now that you mentioned it, um, you know, if you have uh, English-speaking Chinese stars yeah. uh, who speak for themselves, um, yes. uh, interact with the, the but, global but, community. But that's the thing. You in know, fact, at the last... At, at part, some level, China doesn't want you to speak for themselves. They want you to speak for the state and then... It, yeah, it's not going to work, right? And and all the time they are second guessing themselves because of course. you know at which point am I my own person and which point I, am I a, a representative of the state? And right? and without getting too political, but that that's only got worse over the last few years with with the sort of the the, the tightening of the of the censorship and the, and what's acceptable. Sports used to be in this kind of free space where you know no one really cared. You could kind of do or say what you wanted, and now you know. Even sports can be seen as sensitive these days. To be really honest, um, the way in which China tackles these personality issues, uh, I see that coming back into society, uh, where you know, in order to for society to have breakthroughs in science, in business, and so on, you do need these personalities with huge yeah. egos, yeah. Um, you know, representing themselves, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then and then you know, moderate that with the relationship with uh, the system that has created them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. let me just jump in for one second because, you know, you're, you're talking about these other sectors and for, for people who are watching who don't necessarily know much about sports, you know, it, this is kind of one slice of Chinese society. It's, it's the lens through which I've looked at China over the last 15 years. But I do think there are lessons to be learned. It's applicable to, to many other sectors as well. You know, whether it's Jack Ma in technology and a big personality and, and what happens to him and Lena in sports, there's some definite parallels there. And I think it, it's really interesting. You know, you can learn a lot from, from just looking at the sports industry and applying it uh, to many other facets of Chinese life. In fact, in your book, uh, you, towards the end, you were talking about F1 and uh, there is a personality coming on stream, uh, Cho, Cho Guan Yu, Guan yeah. Yu yeah. right? And, uh, and how do you think he's going to play out? Uh, how was he even identified? Because, you know, um, China participates in the F1 circuit and... Uh, uh, as a state-run enterprise, and yet the F1, you know, uh, universe is really a free-for-all. Well, it's not really free-for-all. It's highly, um, you know, um, you know, highly regulated somewhat. Yeah. Um, how did he come up through the system, and how do you think he's going to play out? Well, motorsports, the the domestic uh, series, and I've actually done quite a lot of commentating and, and reporting on the, on motorsport. I hadn't done much before I came to China, but I've been quite involved with with that uh, sport over here, it's still in the earlier stages. It's not that developed. So really to, to reach the top levels, um, the best Chinese drivers have gone over to Europe and, and raced in some of those series uh, from you know maybe their mid teenage years. And, and so that's what Joe Guan Yu does. He's based in London right now. You know, he's posted photos where he fell in love with the sport going to the Chinese Grand Prix in Shanghai, right? That was his first connection to motorsport. That's when he fell in love with it. And said, but right, you need money for it, right? Yeah, motorsport's incredibly expensive, and the higher you, the higher the level you go, the more you need. Now, of course, uh, personal money, not uh, state money. That, that's that's a new dimension. I mean, you can bring in sponsors, and of course, and, and a lot of the people on uh, all around the world. Some of the some of the seats uh, in F one are given because they're bringing in huge sponsorship money. Sometimes state money as well, whether it's from from Russia or from you know, Central and South America, we've seen as well. So the, 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 there is a bit of a narrative that, that Joe Gon Yu is, is there just because he's, you know, going to attract a lot of Chinese sponsors. I think he's a great commercial opportunity, uh, for one thing, but I think he's also very talented. And 
he's just, he's a good character. He's very comfortable in English, very presentable, a likable guy that I think fans in China and the world will warm to. Now, it's his first season. Um, just, he hasn't even started his first season in F1. Unfortunately, he can't even race in his, in his home Grand Prix here in China because it's, it's been scrapped for, for, for COVID reasons. Um, but it's too early to say. But, you know, he's on the radar of someone who could potentially a little bit further down the line. If he's able to hold his own on the track, he could become a, a bit of a global name because F, F1 stars are, are sort of revered around the world, not just in their home countries. Keeping to the theme of personalities, right? Um, you are actually in your book, you, you draw out uh, what personalities are saying about sports. Um, you know, you, we have, you, you said something about um, uh, Su Li Chia, the, the sailing um, you know, the medalist, uh, and what she was reminiscing about what it took to become a sports person and whether it's worth it and so on. Um, do you find um, that um, there's a kind of uh, self-reflection going on that it might be um, harder to get um, star sports people in the future uh, or that whole cauldron is becoming a mixed bag of different um, you know, people with different personalities? Uh, and, and what is the thing that they most um, abhor uh, about the Chinese state, um, you know, uh, sports, ma you know, machine. I think there's a lot there. One thing I'd say is that the 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 countries found it harder to recruit young athletes because it used to be seen as, oh wow, we're selected for a sports school at junior levels. Like this is providing, you know, winning glory for 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 China. Or we're part of this big national effort, and it's going to end up in gold medals. And and even if it's not our personal success, you know, we're part of the system. Um, as the general level, you know, the general uh, well-being of people has improved and their livelihoods, has, the, the level of, of um, you know, their livelihood has, has raised over the years, I think the expectations that people have for their children has also raised. And so the thought of, of sending away, you know, little Johnny or, or little Emma or, or you know, they're, they're, they're one child, of course, and that's significant because they only have, for many families, just the, the one child here sending him away to a sports school from, from a very early age. And the chance of that person then turning into Olympic champion being so remote, like you've got this huge pyramid of people who haven't made it. And wh what are you getting there? Are you really bringing honor? Is that is that person just by being part of the system, bringing much honor to the family? They're not really getting any credit for it. The families are, are missing their child. And I, and I think the, there are higher expectations um, you know, there's more value. People, we don't want to send them away. Like this is not worth it. The payoff is is you know the the risk reward equation there is has just dramatically changed. Um, and you mentioned Shuli Jia. You know, she was. It was so interesting to hear her, and she was very open talking talking to me. Um, she was she's deeply patriotic. She's she's she loves her country, and she's so thankful for the the opportunities that she had. She said, there's no way my parents could have afforded to, to put me into the sailing system and to pay for that without the system, without you know, trying to support, I wouldn't have been able to become Olympic champion. But at the same time, she realized how much she'd given up. And she sort of, you know, the phrase she used, I think it was like, well, you, you kind of give up your freedom and you have to obey what the state tells you to do. And as you know, she was just conflicted, but it was like, well, I'm so grateful. But at the same time, like I also gave up a lot. You know, she went away from the age of, I think nine or 10, and cried and cried and cried, and night after night after night, and then you're basically numb to the pain. And you like, you think about that, it's like, oh, that's tough. That's hard to hear. Just for context, actually, the question I would like to ask you there is: um, every major country that that rose to prominence uh, has gone through this kind of a phase. Germany has gone through this phase. The U.S. has, and the U.K. You know, maybe perhaps a longer time before. Um, you know, when I look at synchronized swimming, for example, it's not the libertarian countries that are, you know, excelling in them anymore. You know, it's the countries where discipline is still, you know, very uh, revered. Um, you know, just give me a sense of what is the kind of system that throws up Olympic champions in the U.S. today? You know, how is that different from China, you think? You know, um, a Phelps or, a, you know, a, a, one of the... The, the major stars. I mean, there's personal discipline and there's a personal sacrifice. Um, uh, is the U.S. also capable of 
continuing to throw out um, you know superstars in sport. The big difference is uh, you have a natural organic base of people to choose from who have selected that sport. And so what that means is uh, the people who rise to the top in those sports have specifically chosen it and they love it. That's why they stick at it. And so the chances of them developing and, and, and progressing are much, much greater. Uh, Shuli Jia, the sailor, said she happened to really like sailing, but she was recruited from uh, a swim team. She, she was a bit sick and her parents were like, oh, well, let, let's throw you into the swim team. Maybe that will help you. And then the, the sailing coach came around and was like, hey, do you want to do this? And she said, I don't know what that is. I don't know what sailing is. Her parents were the same way. And she was like, I happen to love it. But a lot of her teammates were like, that's just a job. They didn't really like sailing at all. They just happened to be quite good. And it's unsurprising that, that she, you know, she was the one that excelled and became Olympic champion because she loved it. She had a passion for sailing. And you know, her teammates didn't. And I think in the West, and again, this is, there are exceptions, of course, but generally the people who rise to the top, they love it. You know, soccer players, they've started with a ball at their feet from the age of three, and they love the game. At, at its root, sport should be about fun. It should be about that passion. And I think we lose that too much in China. Having said that, it is, I am seeing some progress there. I am seeing a shifting uh, in in attitudes towards sport and and middle-class society accepting sport and, and embracing sport in the way that they wouldn't have done in the past and, and getting their kids involved. And so that hopefully over time will produce more organic athletes who have chosen their sport. But here very much Olympic champions are recruited, uh, whether you know from school based on the size of their feet or how tall their parents are, all these sort of different uh, you know, aesthetics and, and, and you know, data points. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit too, it's a lot too much, too, too much uh, regimented here and a bit, you know, the, the old school sort of military training. I'm sure that every country goes through this, um, you know, this, this difficulty of how much state, how much control, how much process. One country that comes to mind is Jamaica, uh, which throws up so many sprinters. Um, and from what I read, uh, the, the Jamaican heritage does not have people who are naturally physically, um, you know, strong runners. Uh, and yet, uh, just by over a 30 year of period or so of putting tracks in every school, uh, you, you actually get that baseline of, uh, you know, young people who are, who are interested enough in running and then you throw up a Hussein Bolt and, uh, uh, and others. So I mean, there, there is that, that, um, that critical mass that needs to be built. And you have, you know, Usain Bolt, it's not gonna end with him. He's gonna inspire the next generation of Jamaican kids that all want to be like him and be the next whoever it is, whatever their name is, not Usain Bolt name anymore. So, you know, that's, that's I think, but, but you need those personalities to inspire. And uh, too many of Chinese athletes don't have that. They don't resonate really at, a, at an emotional level with, with, uh, with the Chinese population. People, you know, celebrate their success because they're proud of, you know, the Chinese people and sports fans are very patriotic. They embrace Chinese success, but they don't connect on an individual basis with that athlete as much as they do in the West, I would say. You know, Mark, the authenticity of your book comes from the fact that you feel the ground, you go out to the games, you know the people that you speak to, um, and, and, um, and you've seen their story over a period of time. Uh, and it comes out very, very well uh, in this book. Um, let me ask you this. What is the one thing that you wish that readers take away from this book? I think, you know, the one, one point I try to make throughout the book is the fact that in China, more than any other country, you can't separate sports from politics from business. Those three strands are inextricably linked, just sort of woven together. And you try and unpick them, but you really can't. And, and I find that fascinating, absolutely fascinating from someone who comes from more of a, you know, a pure sports background. Um, you realize, oh, this is great. You know, the, take the Olympics. It, it's, it's one of the biggest sporting events in the world, you know, along with the World Cup, right? But for China, it's, it's more of a political event than it is a sporting event. So it's great for sports that is happening and it, and it generates a huge amount of, uh, uh, of push for that sport. But why? Deep down, it's because it achieves a certain political goal. Um, that's also fantastic for the economy because the sports industry is absolutely booming and the winter sports industry is seen, 
incredible growth over the last seven years since China was awarded these these games in um, in 2015. Uh, but again, it's it's sort of it, it comes from that top. It's it's a China is a political economy, uh, and you know when push comes to shove, of those three things, sports is a distant third. It really is. Um, but that's just the way it is. Now, a lot of the way, a lot of the times, it can kind of ride on the coattails of politics and business, and and see some great growth. At the same time, there's this Marshall's uh, hierarchy of needs, right? And yeah. when they have already fulfilled um, a lot of the baseline needs, uh, that's the aspirational needs that come into play. And we, uh, the, towards the second half of our conversation, we were talking about personalities, yeah, uh, and and how how personalities, um, you know, correlate with the state and. Uh, and that's uh, as a scene to be seen well into the future. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I hope to be able to stay in touch with you and uh, continue our conversation on this. Great. Take care. At the 2022 Winter Olympics, held right after this conversation, China ranked third, not 10th, as Mark had estimated. But almost all of the new medals came from ethnic Chinese who are from other countries, Canada, the United States, and other winter sport nations. Clearly, China had done a lot of work to jumpstart their Winter Olympic ambitions and at a huge cost. But all of the factors that Mark suggested in our conversation were clearly present and at play. The massive number of foreign players and coaches and the investment in technology, all of these introduced new issues into China's sports industrial complex never seen before. The rise of individual players who grew up in other countries not supported by the state could put a strain on relationships with native sport talent grown from within the system. And the ability of sports to make millionaire superstars out of young personalities adds a new lure to sports as a career. The stakes are high and those who fail risk paying a huge social and personal price in front of a demanding audience. All these raises new issues in the relationship between the state and its people. The conversation with Mark and his book gives some perspective on how these will be played out well into the future.